A very sincere and earnest welcome to all of you, especially knowing that all of you are working extra hours with these heightened demands and the weight of it all on you. So thank you for taking time to do that. And if you have colleagues who are interested in this uh, webinar but weren't able to register, I know we had to cap it off at a certain limit, uh, please let them know that it will be out along with the slides. So I want to say uh, some other thank yous uh, to Carl Jones-Reed, to Andy Andresco, um, to all the panelists that will be a part of this today. Uh, we'll get to them in a second and um, move forward. But if you have questions as we are moving along, I want to invite you. There's a question and answer um, section in the Zoom. That if you put them in there, we will do our best to attend to as many of them as possible. So again, thanks for being a part of this today. My name is Paul Galeshoot. I am the convener of the Hospice Palliative Spiritual Care Research Network. I'm also a research chaplain with M Health Fairview in Minnesota, connected to the University of Minnesota system. And by background, I'm a Transforming Chaplaincy Research Fellow. And connecting me to this work is for 10 years, I worked as an inpatient palliative care chaplain here in Twin Cities. So this is kind of our roadmap um, for what we will be tackling as we uh, move ahead here. Uh, our colleague Dirk Labuschagne and I will be presenting on evidence as our guide, taking a look at some of the peer-reviewed literature. Uh, Christina Hsu, um, out from Southern California, will be with us to talk about that aspect of what's emerging for us in palliative care and COVID. For staff support, Denise Hess will be a part of this from the Support of Care Coalition, and then talking to administration, Katie Hyman out of Long Beach and her health system in that location. And then, as I mentioned, I want to leave some space for Q&A. So it's uh, with a lot of um, esteem that I uh, talk about my partner for this section, Dirk Labuschagne. He is also a research chaplain in the Rush University system. Like me, he's a former uh, Transforming Chaplaincy Research Fellow, and he's also a former palliative care chaplain. So we both bring a lot of passion to this work. So the two areas that we want to present on when we talk about evidence as our guide is we do want to um, just give some brief flyover of some articles because there's not a ton out there because people are too busy taking care of people um, rather than doing research um, amid these times. But there is some data to look at and to point to. And then Dirk and I thought it'd be kind of fun uh, to do a small QI project. So we put an interview guide together and we put it out in the network to have people do some conversations or interviews with us. So we had six of those that we were able to conduct. Some chaplains from all around the um, United States. We didn't talk to anybody internationally. And the average age, or excuse me, the average years of experience for the folks that we interviewed was about seven um, years of experience. So it was a pretty seasoned group that gave us uh, a sense of um, what was happening for them at that time in addressing palliative care and COVID um, in their settings. So I'm going to tackle this uh, first article briefly. So these folks out of Singapore had the wisdom back when SARS was happening in the early 2000s, as it was emerging to say, we should probably uh, make note of this. And so they, um, as a team, said, let's write down what's meaningful for us. And then they also wrote down some very logistical things. And then after the SARS crisis sort of calmed down, they took their notes and they put together an interview guide and they had eight interviews and some focus group material. And then these were the four primary themes that emerged out of their research. And these will not come as any surprise to any of us at this time and place, but isolation was big, especially they emphasized that sense of loss of connection, that powerlessness, helplessness, and frustration. I thought this quote was pretty interesting, that uncertainty was the central obstacle for all of us, this sense of future is, is, uh, is pretty vague at this point. And thank God for some of that biostatistical modeling, but what that means for anybody's soul or psyche is um, a different matter. So this next one, I kind of like the way they framed um, how the sufferer, um, us, care for the suffering. So there's sort of an I am, we reality, and any of us who are in that midst of the uh, patient care arena are experiencing that among ourselves and our team members. And then the, the sense of disruption of bereavement. I think we're seeing uh, much more of that unfold, especially in places like New York and Boston. And of course, more of this will sadly um, happen for us as well. So Dirk has got the next slide. Thanks, Paul. Um, can you hear me OK? Uh, assuming so, oh, I'm going to go ahead. Um, 
and trust that someone will let me know if it's unclear. So the, um, the second article, as Paul mentioned, um, uh, that we'll discuss is, uh, is this one on the screen now um, by Donar and colleagues, which addresses uh, an influenza pandemic um, in particular and raises the concern of hospitals that implement a triage system, um, potentially then um, denying critical care treatment to some seriously, seriously ill patients. So um, by focusing on a specific location and following CDC models, uh, the authors show that the surge would likely overwhelm palliative care resources. And the article finds that most triage systems do guarantee a place for um, palliative care, but there are um, challenges to implementing um, um, and, and provide such a, such a position for um, palliative care. And they name that, so especially around resources needing, needed to fully provide for the demand of palliative care. Um, so it proposes a palliative care search plan and especially focus on uh, what would be needed. Um, so as they are um, calling it, or as you can see there on the screen, um, around things that would be needed around staff, staff space, systems uh, to make that happen. And then um, also particularly helpful is a section where they highlight ethical principles that are particularly relevant to uh, the pandemic context. Um, so an, an, another helpful resource um, in this regard. Um, and then moving on to the third article that we uh, wanna highlight. Um, just, there it is. Uh, so um, this article by Daubman and colleagues um, was actually shared on the Hospice and Palliative Spiritual Care Network um, by one of its members, Dr. Nasreen Lalani. So um, thank you to her and another plug for the network and the way it's helping us to connect to um, helpful resources. Uh, so in the event of natural disasters and humanitarian crises, there's always the risk, um, obviously, of, pop, of people being forced into some kind of end of life situation, which then really highlights the need for palliative care skills, such as empathic listening and um, compassionate communication. So this article does a great job to bring together key expertise that palliative care bring, um, you know, from their non-disaster setting, but then apply them to this disaster setting. And so um, we're kind of highlighting this article and bringing it to your attention uh, for the way it, it advises on triage categories, um, training resources, the importance of cultural competency training, and then the key skills required around communication in a disaster setting. So. Um, please take a look at that article as well. You'll see there are really practical steps to follow, uh, which can be very helpful for yourself or for your colleagues who are um, placed into this challenging setting that we're dealing with today. So that we can move on to the next section. Um, so as Paul briefly mentioned, we um, we gathered some information, um, like you said, he, um, set up some questions and um, talked with them, some chaplains, palliative care chaplains. Um, those conversations happened about a week ago, um, kind of over the course of three days. So I'm just raising that timing piece because things are moving so quickly. And so it's probably helpful for us to just keep that um, timing piece in mind when we report what we've heard talking with chaplains who are working in palliative care. So the first theme we kind of want to highlight based on the questions we ask is the one of triage. So we asked the chaplains we talked with whether they were aware of their palliative care team having involvement in the system's triage plan for COVID-19. And then related to that, um, with this possibility that the palliative care palliative team could become overrun with con consults 
uh, we wondered if the chaplains were aware of a plan to help coordinate chaplaincy care of palliative patients if the chaplain, the palliative care chaplain was not able to see all of these patients personally. Um, so keeping in mind this timing piece, so at this point, not all the medical centers um, um, where the chaplains were working had COVID cases yet. And so the, uh, that obviously kind of um, impacted their responses. But we did hear of centers who were already having their palliative care teams um, work from home um, using phones as much as possible to try to still do palliative care work. And obviously there were challenges involved with that. Um, from one center we heard that they developed kind of like their own triage system to help them kind of categorize patients and the various needs they have in order to coordinate um, their response and kind of guide the work that they're doing. Um, but as far as we know, they didn't, this um, center wasn't necessarily connected to the overall systems triage plan. We didn't really hear of pa palliative care teams being incorporated into triaging plans, you know, which doesn't mean that those plans did not exist, but um, it just sounded like that information, at least at the time that we talked with chaplains, have not been communicated to, um, to them yet. In terms of how palliative care um, chaplains was triaging with other chaplains in their system, that really varied. So um, based on how much each chaplain had to devote to palliative care um, versus other responsibilities, for example, were they full-time with palliative care team or only 30%, et cetera, um, that really kind of varied and impacted how they could um, do triaging. Um, some chaplains felt the tension between how their palliative care team was responding to the pandemic as opposed to how the spiritual care department was responding, kind of playing this dual role, um, hearing different information depending with who they talk. That sometimes provided a challenge. Um, and then we didn't hear of any set plans to have other non-palliative care chaplains help out with the palliative care chaplain if those needs would become more acute. And um, we really a kind of, I think a central theme here was the kind of old hands on deck situation is that, you know, there were a bunch of spiritual care needs across the system and palliative care chaplains had to kind of, you know, step up and help out wherever um, they can. And palliative care wasn't particularly um, um, prioritized in this regard. Uh, and then the um, second theme was on restrictions. And so here we're kind of interested how, on how um, the restrictions placed on visitors, how that impacted patients and families, and how that kind of impacted the interventions that chaplains were providing. And so again, the timing here plays an important role. Um, um, you know, some centers didn't have restrictions in place, but they were definitely aware of them coming. But for those that had restrictions in place, um, you know, there was kind of variance in that regard. Um, some had two visitors for end of life situation or just one. Um, you know, it was tough to kind of um, give guidance in that regard. So if, you, if you're saying, you know, when is it an end of life situation? Is it when, the, when it's within five hours of dying? And if so, you know, how do you interpret that or use that as a guideline? Um, as we know, prognosis is really um, challenging to do. Um, and then there was um, things around the burden of enforcing these restrictions, whose responsibility was it? Um, but once these restrictions were um, rolled out, um, there were definitely, definitely stories about tearful patients, frustrated family members, concerns around um, wanting to guide um, discharge planning and concerned about family members or um, patients having to go to certain nursing facilities or nursing homes, which wasn't particularly suited to what their needs were. Um, these restrictions potentially impacting end of life plans were quite complicated. Uh, lost chances to do last things. Uh, was something we heard, um, um, how to 
tree of how to um, get outside clergy in, um, concerns around not being able to receive the rituals they really want to um, receive at end of life. Um, but then we also heard families being understanding, uh, having understanding for the restrictions, wanting their families to be safe. Um, and then in terms of how chaplains were responding to these, um, we did hear people trying to use the phone as much as possible. Some centers did have iPads in place that could enable video chats, but there was definitely uncertainty around using those, um, some frustration, especially when it comes down to setting up family meetings over the phone and having chaplains be present in that um, without always being able to be physically present. Um, uh, that was definitely challenging. Okay, handing it back to Paul. Thanks, Derek. So, um, as I appreciate Dirk covering those uh, themes. And then these were some additional themes based upon the questions that we asked. Being palliative care folks, we of course wanted to look at domain five kind of things as they're discussed in the national consensus guidelines. So RSE is religious, spiritual, existential. Didn't specifically name existential. I think that's just sort of the, um, it's, I think it's the pool we're swimming in right now. But to cover a little bit of that sense of a religious struggle, uh, one of the participants commented on, not only is there all these other dimensional sense of isolation, but there was a sense that, that people are also feeling isolated from the sacred. So if you're a big fan of Ken Parliament, like many of us, uh, I guess you could sort of put that under the banner of like intrapersonal, uh, spiritual, or religious struggle. And then we also heard, like many of you are hearing, that people are separated from their faith communities, um, they're not being able to attend religious events and then have those connected meetings, whether of course that be somebody who's Roman Catholic and not able to receive um, the Eucharist. But also I think, as Dirk mentioned, having your beloved pastor come in and provide that sense of spiritual support to you uh, amid this crisis. Spiritual distress was something we heard. Uh, one of the quotes that we heard about that is that palliative patients in particular are getting hit with this double whammy. Not only are they living with a serious illness that perhaps makes them um, and their comorbidity more vulnerable within their illness status, but now they're adding this threat. And so there's that preponderance of uh, pressure and stress that is a part of that. And then uh, for those of us who've done this work, I mean, whether technically under the banner of palliative care, but I think any time that we do patient care, there's that sense that we always kind of hear a future story. And uh, one of the participants commented on that what has been vanishing is, uh, especially among palliative patients, you used to hear about, I want to get to my grandson's graduation, or I want to get to that wedding, or I want to be able to attend a certain event, and that's just, that's just gone. So how is it that these stories are perhaps broken and they need now to be reconfigured? And then we also asked chaplains uh, or spiritual care providers what they experience for distress. And, uh, one of them commented on they're always constantly dealing with the changes. It's hard to keep up, and Dirk addressed some of that as well. That there is that um, what we read in some of the literature that was addressed earlier in this webinar that uh, our own families are stressed, and that some of us are even social distancing ourselves from our partners and kids and loved ones within our families. And then touch was a big one. Uh, it's such a natural part of who we are. Um, I was on call uh, last night and was in the intensive care unit. And there were many occasions where I wanted to reach out and touch or hug or, um, but it's just, as we know, that there are these limits uh, for our protection and theirs. And then we also asked about that sense of uh, staff support. And um, overall, yeah, that we heard that there was this sense of fear, anxiety, grief, the unknown, uh, themes that are familiar to all of you. Then we heard people talking about how palliative care are supporting other staff, especially in the intensive care units, um, in the inpatient um, settings. We specifically wondered about burnout, um, and I'm using the burnout definition from Christina Moslock and, and her colleagues like Leiter, um, where it's got these three components of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and inefficacy. And I think one of the um, articles that Dirk mentioned, the palliative pandemic, talked about yeah, we're going to probably see a lot more burnout. So there was a prevalence of burnout in palliative care that was already relatively high, and now you put this into the mix, and of course, I think that's just going to 
be burgeoning. So um, the people that we talked to said they're just beginning to see more of that pronounced exhaustion. And again, as Dirk said, that perhaps was by the timing, I think, of when we asked and did these interviews. And then um, I think we're starting to see much more of that sense of people resisting that depersonalization, that, that we are human beings caring for human beings, and that, um, as I'm starting to see emerge on things like that, AHPM uh, forums that, that no one does dialogue or, and being strong advocates for that. We also asked about moral distress and using that kind of definition that, that I'm unable to take that desire to write course of action based upon the barriers, whether it be institutional or whether it be like we're experiencing just life systemic challenges. And at the time of the interviews, uh, people were saying, I'm not really seeing that just yet uh, in a terms of a more systemic way I mean, that's always something that's going to be happening in our healthcare settings but in a more pervasive way that wasn't showing up as much yet and then um, the palliative care team talking about how um, care is going to have to be limited some way and that people one of the comments was it just won't be the normal goals of care conversations that we are used to having in palliative care so i'm going to transition here quickly to christina but i do want to say a special thanks especially if they're tuning into this webinar to the participants who were so generous with their time and their perceptions and their views. So thanks to that. And then I do want to encourage everybody as we leave this evidence as our guide section to dig into those articles. They are not big, hairy, quantitative articles. They are review articles and a nice qualitative articles. So I do invite you to go to the network and download those for your use. So uh, moving on to uh, what's showing up in patient care. Uh, Reverend Christina Hsu is out in Southern California at the Cedar sinai Medical Center in LA. She's been there for nine years uh, where they call their palliative care the supportive care medicine team. And she's also co-facilitator or co-convener for the Transforming Chaplaincy's Functions Research Network. So thank you to Christine. It's all yours. Hi everyone. Um, thank you so much, Paul. And um, I will give a sort of on the grounds view. I am an inpatient palliative care chaplain and we have a fairly large uh, um, supportive care palliative care team with physicians, social workers, pharmacists, um, nurse practitioners, and a triage nurse, and we also have outpatient care. Um, and I'm located here in Los Angeles um, at a pretty big medical center, and I'm also part of our spiritual care department, which has about 12 staff chaplains and a CPE program. Um, I wanna start by just kind of echoing the balance of uncertainty and the unknown uh, with our skills as palliative care chaplains with what we do know, like how to hold grief and um, change and loss and um, how we can be flexible and creative in those situations. Um, I also want to just be humble that what my department is doing and what my institution is doing is is just that. And so I don't know if there's any um, right way or standard for what's happening right now. So my palliative care team and my spiritual care department have created a sort of triage system um, in terms of referrals. So for palliative care, that looks like um, things that are just an introduction so they get to know you or an introduction of hospice. Um, our lower level and our triage nurse or pharmacist are trying to do some of those uh, remotely versus higher symptom needs and more complicated goals of care um, or end of life situations. So our palliative care team has sent some members to work from home. So all of our social workers, our pharmacists and triage nurse are working from home. Um, outpatient is also doing a lot of work from home, but we still have inpatient um, providers. Um, in our spiritual care team, we are also still here in person um, and we are prioritizing doing telephone calls for introductions like brief check-ins or follow-ups with people that we know and continuing to do in-person visits for people who are having more complicated needs. Um, so just to give an example, um, oh, I should start also say that currently in our palliative care team and in our spiritual care team, we are not seeing confirmed COVID-19 patients. We are, our plan is to discuss those referrals as they come up. 
um, for spiritual care to do telephone um, or video and um, in palliative care anticipating that there will be quite a lot of uh, potential referrals for patients who might be dying of COVID-19 to discuss those as a team. Um, so yesterday I did telephone visits in the morning and in the afternoon I saw a couple people in person, one who is an a inpatient hospice patient who we have allowed um, a couple family members to be at bedside, so I visited with them in person. I visited with another patient who's been hospitalized for about um, one and a half months who has a lot of spiritual pain and distress in person. And then I also visited a patient who was being medically extubated, but um, uh, we expect that she might not do well in the next few days and her husband was allowed to come in and see her for that time. So I visited with him. Um, in terms of spiritual care issues, I think as mentioned by our other panelists, the feeling of isolation and missing the normal family support both um, by the patient and by family uh, is just so intense and um, there's so many different things um, that we have often relied on families to do whether it is maybe some language interpretation or um, you know just assistance with things in the room to all of the kind of um, emotional care and um, support for this really anxious time that they provide. Um, we're also seeing a lot of um, concerns about family's risk or concerns from family about patient's risk. So for our inpatient uh, hospice patient, I think that in the past we would have probably discharged them to a sniff on hospice and um, the family was really resistant to that because they were really worried about their their loved one going to a sniff during this time um, so we were able to keep them in-house and that worked out although the family also expressed a lot of sadness that they weren't able to have as many family members as they wanted to come and be with their patient um, i think also seeing a lot of impact on other future plannings not just discharge but of course memorial planning or um, just looking forward to other events, which now can't happen. Um, and then also some people saying the feeling of having their own personal distress, like having metastatic cancer, um, being overwhelmed by this national tragedy or national crisis that everyone is going with. So saying, you know, it's bad enough that I have this and I'm so worried and anxious about this, but also the whole world seems to be going crazy. So next slide. If someone could click to the next slide, please. Yes, perfect. Um, so for family care, um, we are doing a lot of phone calls to family who can't come in. Um, and I am using the sort of recommendations from telehealth about really trying to not frighten patient, uh, families by saying, I don't have any medical information and this call is really for your support, it's routine. Um, we are fielding questions about, you know, is our visitor policy changing? Uh, the visitor allowance um, is for really specific circumstances. It is also a little bit dependent, we've noticed on um, nurse managers for each floor. So sometimes, you know, a family might be told, uh, no, you can't visit today, and then it changes tomorrow. Uh, and I've had some family members uh, who have literally just stayed in the room. So our visitor ban went into effect about a week and a half ago, and one wife uh, just never left. And the staff knows, and I think they've given her that allowance, but she's so terrified about leaving to even go to the cafeteria that she won't be let in back up. Um, so she has just stayed in the room. Uh, again, families have a lot of worries or fears about um, their risk of infection, about um, coming back and forth, or about um, what it would be like to take someone home from the hospital. And then we're also working on other ways that they connect. So if that's um, FaceTime or asking, advocating for an exemption for them. Um, just to, to give another example of a 
difficulty for a family. We had a patient who was very delirious. And so he calls his family and says things like, I'm in a hallway. And so our palliative care team was doing a lot of reassurance to his family who can't see him that that isn't true and that he's being taken care of. And, um, you know, he's safe. Um, in another time, they would be able to just be at his bedside. Next slide. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to touch on was just our workflow as a palliative care team and what um, I've been doing. So because half of our team is working from home, we are doing um, team huddles in the mornings that are updates, especially about COVID-19. And then we're also doing rounding with some members calling in from home and I'm doing a lot of phone calls or texting with our social workers about coordinating um, support for patients and also kind of dealing with a lot of um, those feelings of responsibility and guilt. I, I think our social workers really want to be in person, but at the same time uh, want to protect our patients and themselves. I feel the same way. Um, so we've had conversations about, you know, I'm glad that you could go in person, but I'm also uh, wish that, you know, telephone would work better in this situation for this particular patient. Um, and then we have um, various members of our team who are participating in institutional plans. So uh, we have a couple physicians who are working with um, these sort of best practice groups that are set up. So that's for the ICU and for the ER um, for COVID-19 treating teams. And what we have started working on as a palliative care team is developing a handout um, like a um, a brief card that would go over symptom management for respiratory distress especially, and also um, symptom management if we're transferring to comfort care, as well as communication strategies. So a lot of um, wording that's taken from the Vital Talk uh, document, and also just general communication around um, serious illness and end of life care. So that's, we're, proposing to give that to the ICU teams and the R teams thinking that they will have to have a lot of these conversations and might not be able to have enough palliative care team members to support them in that. Um, and we are also, um, as chaplains and social workers, reaching out to some of those frontline teams, talking to their social workers, asking how we can support them and how we can support nursing staff. Uh, and then there is a team within our institution uh, with, led by our clinical ethics team that is working on protocols around resource allocation and what that would look like, um, developing a protocol and then asking for other team members who would be willing to support um, clinicians if they are giving that information to families if we come to that. So we're also involved in that work. Um, and, and generally, as chaplains, we're thinking a lot about staff support, um, and that trans, uh, transitions perfectly into our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. I do appreciate you giving a nice visual picture of what is going on um, amid all the time, and again, the gift of your time and expertise in the midst of this time. Also a part of the network is Denise Hess. Some of you know her as the Executive Director of the Supportive Care Coalition. Uh, Denise also is a former palliative care chaplain and um, is ordained minister of the BCUSA and is a um, LMFT. Um, so I'm, I'm sure you have more letters to add to the back of your name, Denise, but I'll stop there. And I'm so delighted to have you among us. Thank you for talking about staff support. Thank you, Paul, and uh, thanks, Dirk and Christina, too, for uh, laying it out so clearly for us. I, as I was listening to all three of you, I, I just can't help but think that anytime we're using words like triage, surge, resource allocation, all hands on deck, uh, we're definitely in the territory of moral distress of where even if folks aren't feeling it just yet, um, it's in the air and um, it is, I believe it is happening. In fact, Christina, the, the example you just gave um, is one of several examples I have been hearing from folks uh, in our member system. So our member systems extend across the country coast to coast and 
So we've been in touch with folks in Washington. Um, I'm located in Oregon. We have uh, folks in New York and Boston and all around. Um, and what we're hearing are, are examples like these that to me um, illustrate moral distress. And as uh, Paul highlighted the Corley definition, the 2002 Corley definition, I, I like to um, de academic size that and just say it's that feeling that you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. And how I'm hearing that uh, being voiced by all members of the palliative care interdisciplinary team is in what Christina was just talking about. Folks are saying, I really feel this obligation to be at work right now, as in the, the ethical obligation, the duty to care. Yet at the same time, I myself have reasons um, that I need to be extra protective of my own health um, or just that general, that other ethical principle, that duty to self-protect, to care for our own lives. When the, things like that are intention, that's that damned if you do, damned if you don't feeling. Um, similarly, one of the really uh, just heartbreaking examples I'm hearing coming from folks I'm in touch with across the country is that palliative care, our, our primary intervention is this goals of care discussion. So this is for COVID positive, non-COVID positive, just seriously ill folks there who happen to be hospitalized or in a setting where visitation is restricted. Their loved ones, their decision makers and the patients are having to make goals of care decisions while they are not able to physically see one another. And they're having to do that with the palliative care team's help in a setting where, aside from what the palliative care team is, is telling the patient and family, the palliative care teams are being told not so subtly um, that and warned that it will be a time coming very soon where that ICU bed that that may be not so critically ill patient is in right now might be needed in the next week or two. So basically that, that kind of constant pressure that palliative care teams always live under of kind of close the deal, you know, get the DNR, um, it's escalating right now. And again, ripe, ripe for, for moral distress. Uh, and I would say that of course as chaplains and I would bring in our social work colleagues here and our nursing colleagues, because we have to remember that the moral distress literature uh, really emerged from the nursing profession. We have a lot of great tools normally at our disposal for moral distress. Everything from employee assistance programs to Schwartz rounds to code lavenders to psychological first aid to just really good chaplain support, social worker support of staff. But also what I'm hearing from folks is none of those, no one's holding Schwartz rounds right now. Um, maybe months from now, we'll be able to begin uh, debriefing and processing all that we're going through right now. So instead, we have to rely on maybe some more just in time, um, right in the minute kinds of tools. And so I, I share this slide and the following slides for all of us today as part reminder and part Hopefully, oh, you can go back one slide actually, um, as a helpful frame for what you might be seeing and experiencing on the ground right now. And so building on Corley's 2002 work on moral distress, Epstein, Hamrick, many others have, have built out this concept of moral distress, recognizing that one morally distressing incident doesn't magically disappear. It, do, it leaves an imprint. It leaves a permanent mark on you in some way, shape, or form. And, and that doesn't necessarily have to be negative. Um, it can be post-traumatic growth. It can be a growth in moral courage and moral resilience. However, we need to recognize that none of us, ourselves included, and all of the caregivers that we interact with in our settings are entering this particularly morally distressing event as blank slates. We all come into this with some, what Epstein and, and Hammer call, moral residue. So we've all already, because by nature of our profession, 
we've been involved with those intractable cases where whether it's the physician who kind of refuses to communicate honestly with his patients and we we believe there's medically inappropriate treatment happening and no one's telling the family to uh, i could go on and on to family members who won't allow or, or agree to adequate pain management because they feel that might hasten the death all of those morally distressing events are in our bodies and our hearts and our minds and our spirits still and we bring that with us into this moment and then what epstein identifies and again as chaplains what i think we need to be looking for in ourselves and in those we care for is then there becomes a potentiality for what they call a moral residue crescendo so when you have morally distressing events one after the other after the other there comes a point for each of us and we all have a different threshold for tolerance when we can have basically a moral distress breakdown and that is where we see things like that case that became that uh, news story that became famous so many years ago of it was just a photo of an emergency room doctor who walked out the back of the emergency room and was kneeling up against a low cement wall, uncontrollably weeping. Yes, he had had a patient, a teenage patient, who had died that very day under his care, but he was crying for much, much, much more than that. So that is the kind of staff support and the kind of frame that I think might be helpful for those of us um, supporting staff at this particular time. And then if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, this I think would be our long range view. So right now we're watching out for those crescendos. We're watching out for those, those breakdowns and offering just in time, in the moment, presence, support to the degree that we're able. The long range goal though, and this is from um, Cinda Rushton and Monica Sharma's work and uh, Cinda's great book, um, I think it's her most recent book. It's called Moral Resilience, Transforming Moral Suffering in Healthcare. And so again, long range goal as we, as we hopefully uh, look to and think about life post pandemic, they suggest kind of this three layered approach. First, recovering, processing morally distressing events begins with the outer circle. It begins with self-awareness, with an understanding of our beingness in it what we did what we didn't do what we felt what we didn't feel what we thought what we didn't think and then from there moving a circle in to hopefully that leads to a greater understanding of our own patterns personally and relationally that may have led to um our tendency maybe to to overcare or not practice healthy boundaries or not honor our own needs for self-protection um, and then they envision this of course happening in a group setting uh, kind of as a ongoing uh, systemic discernment if you will and that this process would lead to a collective greater commitment to align who we are as individuals, who we are relationally and pattern-wise in our systems, with what we do as systems. And they talk about this ability to develop moral resi resilience to the degree that we are able to align these three things so that folks are working in systems where they feel they are able to feel what they feel, see what they see, think what they think, say what they need to say, and be understood and that the system also um, is in alignment with that is not in opposition to them that there is justice that there is transparency that there is um, truth-seeking behavior and so short term watching for the moral distress and signs of it to show up longer term i think we as chaplains and researchers have a very very primary role to play in being the voices who can advocate for systems that support uh, healthy workplace environments and that includes environments where 
folks can process um, and talk about the moral distress they experience. And so next slide, just a, a brief offering um, as I spoke about what to do right now. We're not gonna be holding short short rounds. Um, kudos to you if your institution is still able to do code lavenders and, and things like that. But our, our website, supportivecarecoalition.org, we reconfigured and, and created a caregiver well-being site. And this is just a screenshot of that site. It has short meditations, reflections, poems, um, breathing exercises, things that in a shorthand way, I'll just say will help all of us down-regulate and bring on board our parasympathetic nervous systems. Again, moral distress gets imprinted in us in the same kinds of ways trauma gets imprinted in us. And so every little bit of pausing, of stopping, of noticing, of taking that U-turn, that inward turn and checking in with your inner world, seeing what's happening inside, breathing, being with all are incredibly, they sound maybe very simple, maybe not to this audience, um, to other audiences, they might sound a little um, soft or light, um, but very robust techniques to, to keep our mind and our heart and our bodies uh, attuned and aligned to the best of our abilities right now. And I will hand it off to Katie at this point. I think she has more to say about uh, systems and administration. Yes, thank you very much, Denise. I so appreciate that. As I had told you on email, I love the dog and the boa very much. Uh, that kind of gets me into a nice centering place. So because there's not a whole lot of baseball happening right now, I just want to say, Katie, I'm so glad you're hitting cleanup for us here at this point. And um, I promised that I'm not, uh, Katie's not a part of this panel because of her background and being from Minnesota, but I do like that part of your background. In addition to Katie being a lead chaplain in her setting in Long Beach, she now serves as a program uh, administrator for the palliative care team out there. And so she brings some unique insights into that. So thanks so much, Katie, for your uh, presence and your expertise among us. Thanks for having me. Um, I, Yes, so my role is a bit unique. I am a chaplain by background, but uh, now my primary role is the administrator, program coordinator for palliative care in our adult hospital here in Southern California. We're a large community sized hospital, um, part of a small healthcare system. Uh, so, one thing that I'll say about administration is that this is going to be different for you because spiritual care is situated differently in different organizations in relationship to palliative care. The system we have here is that our, uh, I think like Christina has at Cedars, our chaplain on our team reports to the director of spiritual care, our social worker reports to the director of social work, and uh, other palliative care, our nurse practitioners, and I report to the executive director of palliative care. So some of these decisions will make a difference or will be different based on your org chart or, or how those lines of authority are drawn. One thing of similarity that I see in both palliative care and spiritual care is that we both occupy spaces and roles that other people are really confident that they can do that they don't need a specialist, that they are perfectly fine to ask somebody uh, how they're feeling and sit and listen to them, or that they're fine doing symptom management or getting a DNR. Um, and so a lot of times in spiritual care, I think, and in palliative care, we spend quite a bit of energy defining uh, and maybe protecting our roles uh, so that we continue to have jobs and so and continue to articulate and advocate for the specialist role for why we're important and vital. My perspective on this in a time of crisis is that we are gonna have to let a lot of that go. Um, because if we move to say where New York is now in Southern California, uh, in, in LA County from Wednesday to Thursday, they doubled the number of uh, COVID positive 
people. That's a really scary slope to be looking at. And so if we get to the point where we are at crisis, every single person is going to be in spiritual, religious, and existential crisis, and every single person would qualify for a palliative care referral under normal circumstances. And so my perspective from the administrative side is that now is the time for us to get generalist palliative care skills and generalist spiritual care skills into the hands of as many people as possible. And Christina touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, uh, I'll talk in a minute about how we, uh, some of the specific tools that we're using. We need to blow those dandelion seeds and let them take root where they will. We need to just be as generous as possible because we are not going to be able to do it all. Whether you are one chaplain for covering a whole hospital and you're already stretched, in our hospital, we're really lucky to have well-resourced spiritual care and palliative care teams, but the governor of California has asked that every hospital work to be able to double their capacity. So that means that we are half as effective for a population that is more than twice as sick. So we're gonna have to let go of some of our need to protect our roles during this time. And then that also means figuring out what we are the primary experts in. So can you go to the next slide? This is a sample uh, of what we've done for our palliative care team. What we did was we sat down and we said, what are the things that we do? We can no longer do the what's. We, uh, or sorry, we can no longer do the how's. We have to still do the what's. So we talked about what does it look like now for us? Or what does it look like when we're super busy? And then what's it going to look like if we have a hospital surge? If we are in a place of at capacity, over capacity, possibly in a position to ration resources. So, and then we talked through each of those items. So right now our referrals come through Epic pretty regularly. If we get to crisis, um, our team is not gonna function in that interdisciplinary way anymore. Our social worker and our chaplain are gonna be redeployed as a social worker and a chaplain to use those skills where they need to be. So our um, docs and NPs, will be huddling with unit leaders, they will be going out to find people. And they will be serving more in a consultative role than actually entering the orders. We have a concept here called the physician in charge that will be activated. And that is the person that will be doing all the orders for patients on the units in a crisis. Our primary function now is goals of care and uncontrolled symptoms. That's, we can't do that for patients, for everybody in the hospital then. So the specific resources that we're sending out now are the Vital Talk talking maps. If you've not accessed these, they're tremendous. They're on the vitaltalk.org website, including the really brilliant playbook that Tony Bach and others are editing daily and updating with some conversation tips and also the talking maps. So Calmer is how to bring up COVID conversations in it's sort of early while patients are still interactive and able to talk. Guide is the talking map that they have already for how to deliver serious news and nurses for how to respond to emotions. Um, when we get to crisis, we will be releasing the share conversation map, which is the vital talk map that they've put out for. It's sort of, you're not asking people what their values are. You're saying, this is what the guideline is here is what is going to happen for your care. We don't get to ask you your preference anymore. Uh, and then CAPSI put out some brilliant crisis symptom management protocols that we're gonna be distributing widely too uh, for nurses, for residents, for anybody who needs it. If So don't consult us if your patient is just nauseated or has a cough. <laughs> Please try these things first. Um, I am gonna stop talking now so that people have a chance to ask questions. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Paul. Katie, thanks so much. I do appreciate that. And I, um, 
that's kind of you to truncate your uh, presentation here on behalf of, uh, I guess, the whole and get letting some folks have a chance to um, hear some questions. So if you have some questions and you perhaps have already done that, um, Carl, if you're on the line, would you mind even, uh, I know we've got just a minute um, or two here. Uh, if you have access to those, I would um, love it if, uh, I don't know, there's actually a couple of questions that already got answered here. So it doesn't look like we have um, any questions per se. I'll wait here a second. All right. Um, tell you what, I'm going to move forward here. And if you have some questions, let us know. I just want to mention that uh, we're going to have some future webinars within this hospice palliative spiritual care research network space. So please stay attentive to that. Um, Denise Hess had mentioned that on April 23rd, the uh, Supportive Care Coalition is gonna be hosting um, a webinar, so please pay attention to that space as well. I think being connected at this time is critical. So invite your colleagues, please, to join um, the Hospice Palliative Spiritual Care Research Network. And I, th I think as we tried to stress in the literature that Dirk and I presented in the beginning, uh, the point isn't that we're all researchers. The, the point is, is that we, we are um, letting the evidence be our guide. And I think as we're looking um, to the world and to our nation, I think some of the best guidance that we have is when people do look at, at the data. So uh, that's something that I think that we wanna mirror and reflect as well in our practice and our vocation. So to that end, I wanna mention a couple of colleagues are gonna be presenting on Monday. Um, if you don't have this information yet, please check out the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab. Uh, I'm not sure it's on the Transformer Chaplaincy website, but please check out that, that as well. But Tim Usset, uh, a Transformer Chaplaincy Fellow, and a bunch of other things that you can see on the screen there is going to be presenting along with Jeannie Wurpsa, a uh, chaplain and ethicist at Northwestern in Chicago about this pandemic and what the ethics of it are. And some of that was delved into here, but they're going to take uh, a much deeper dive into that as well. Uh, so, I'm uh, looking at a question here. It said, please list Denise's website for Meditations Poetry that she mentioned. Um, That's a Supportive Care Coalition. Denise, if you're on, if you want to mention that, I wouldn't mind that as well. Yeah, sure. And I can forward it to you too. You can put it on the website. Uh, it's www.supportivecarecoalition all one word, dot O-R-G. And you'll see one of the headers at the top is called Caregiver Wellbeing. And Paul, right. this is Katie. Yeah. There's yeah, a, one comment uh, uh, from, I think, Etje Verhagen in the Netherlands, where evidently they've developed a protocol for sort of farewell meetings where the family can't be with the patient. And um, yes, if you're able to share that, that would be great. Uh, Vital Talk has also put out something for sort of doing over the phone if the patient, if the family can't be there and the patient is at end of life, uh, that you can uh, see that. I see another question from Laura Kelly asking if the Vital Talk guides are free. They are. It's vitaltalk.org. And they, um, yes, they're free on there and you should be able to see all of them. They have a coronavirus uh, resources page that's right there. Great. Thanks very much for catching that, Katie. I, I appreciate that. Uh, folks, let's keep talking, keep coming back to this space. Again, if you're not a part of the um, network yet, please somehow get a hold of us. Uh, go to the Transforming Chaplaincy website and we'll make sure that you get connected to us. But again, thanks for all your work, your devotion to the care uh, that you are doing and best to you and blessings in that process.